Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm going to talk today about the danger of single Christian women. Um, there's two ways to preach. You can tell people what they want to hear or what they need to hear. And uh, what they need to hear is they need to hear the Scriptures. And uh, Paul wrote about, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, if you're a Bible believer, uh, you're going to submit yourself to the Word of God. If you're not a Bible believer, well, then you need to get saved. It's just as simple as that. Uh, you can't tell me that somebody is saved and yet refuses this book as an authority in their life. I don't believe that. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. We're going to talk about a subject that I think a lot of women are just going to close their minds to. You get single women and they just say, I'm happy with what I'm doing here. I got my career and I got my this and I got my that. And I really don't want a man in my life. It's kind of weird if a woman says that because uh, you're supposed to have a man in your life named Lord Jesus Christ. So you want Jesus, the man in your life, but you don't want a Christian man in your life. How does that work? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. There's a lot of women out there that profess to be Christians, and they are turned aside after Satan. Uh, what do you mean by turned aside after Satan? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. When did the devil go after Eve? When she was away from Adam. When she was away from the man being there to protect her. And she could have, she could have called out to Adam. She could have said, excuse me, I can't talk to you. My husband's not here. But no, she was a strong woman. She was strong enough that she was willing to add to Scripture. She was smart, you see. And the devil said, hey, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. He shall not surely die. Lied to her. And I've seen this thing with women over and over and over again. And that is, there are men that will take advantage of them. They'll lie to them. But if a woman is under proper spiritual headship, that's not going to happen. She's going to be protected by a strong man. So, oh, well, this sure sounds sexist and feminine, or against the feminist movement. Well, it's definitely against the feminist movement, yeah. And this term sexist is not a King James Bible word, so I reject it. If you are a Bible believing Christian, you will submit yourself to this book. You're going to look at these scriptures that I'm going to give you today, and you're going to pray about this and say, okay, Lord, what do I need to do here? And don't say this thing, well, there's not many good Christian men out there. Can God provide you with a husband? Yeah. Well, well, Brian, but there's, there's things about being single as a Christian. Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Single Christian woman and all this stuff. We're going to get to that. But right here, he says, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry bear children, guide the house. Guiding the house is not a small kind of a role that's just kind of, you know, women are just trash in God's system and things like this. Guiding the house, that's an important thing. And again, I, I've, I've known women, you know, had all kinds of different women write to me and things over the years and, and you know, I get this thing from women, oh, I just don't know if, you know, I like this system that God has set up here and things. You need to submit yourself to the book. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Go on back there. I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures today in this study. I'm going to talk about the thing of why it's dangerous to be a single Christian woman. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Hmm. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. 
Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So what do we see there? One of the purposes of marriage is, if you have sexual desire of any kind, then you need to get married. You don't say, well, I'm just going to occasionally fornicate with a guy and then just, oh, God, please forgive me for that until the next time I'm, I'm really burning with lust and then I'll do it again and say, oh, I messed up again, Lord. Please forgive me. I'll just keep doing this until the rapture, you know, until it's time to, to go. And I'll just keep, sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. You're disobeying Scripture when you do that. But it's interesting. You do get married and then you start to say, hey, Let's, I'm going to cool the marriage bed down a little bit there for you ladies out there. And I'm going to cool it down because I don't, I'm not getting what I want. And so I'll just use this. I'll tell him I have a headache or whatever else. You know what happens? You start to get away from your husband. What happens? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And it can happen to the man too if he does, for some reason, defrauds the wife. You know, I don't want to do it, you know, whatever. It can happen to both. But isn't it interesting there, when husband and wife start to start to pull apart, the devil comes right in there. That's what we saw over in 1 Timothy chapter 5. How about that? Continuing. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So Paul is saying there, okay, I'm going to say this. I think it's good for people to stay single and whatever. But if you have you know, sexual desire, if you have lust, then you need to marry. He does say that. So you say, well, good. Then I, I'm a single Christian woman. I don't need to get married. Oh. Uh, there are some stipulations for that, which I'm going to be going over in this study. Um, but you're, you're on shaky ground. Verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and not, let not the husband put away his wife. Very true for Christians. It's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be divorced there. Go to verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife, seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife, seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Again, Paul is saying a lot of the thing in here about, hey, if you're, you know, I mean, what's one of the big things with the Corinthians? They're having all kinds of sexual problems, all kinds of fornication and everything else. So Paul's really saying, hey, you know, some of you people would be better if you just kind of stayed single for a while here, okay? <laughs> you understand? But he's not saying staying single is better than marriage, right? And we're going to see that as we continue here, right? And, of course, you will have trouble in the flesh as a married person, but I can speak from experience and tell you that you will have other types of trouble as a single person. Even if you're not burning with lust, you're still going to have other types of problems as a single person. And, you know, as a single man, I'll say that. Single woman, you're going to have all kinds of troubles. And we're going to get into those. I'm going to show you those today. Verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. You know, I lived, verse 32, for 36 years. And now I've been living, verse 33, there, uh, for be the six years here in May that I've been married. So I've done both, all right? And I'm going to tell you right now, verse 32 isn't all it's cracked up to be. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 
there was a lot of times when all I did was just ministry type of stuff, just studying and studying research and everything else. And I was, I was burning out a lot worse. And, you know, even after I got married, there were many times I didn't, you know, really have much fellowship with my wife and things. And I didn't take her places and, and care for the things of the world, you know. Um, there was a lot of times I just worked hard. It'll burn you out after a while. A wife can be there, and then especially when you have children, they are there to help temper the ministry. Again, it's not a bad thing. I mean, why do you think Paul was just so careless and reckless all the time? Because he was single. He didn't have to worry about anybody but himself, you see? So he'd go and get beaten and thrown in prison and whatever else. But when you get married, you can be in ministry, very strong ministry, but always keep in mind, hey, I have a wife and a son to take care of. There are times we need to just take a day off and we need to go for a hike in the woods or we need to go whatever, whatever you want to do for recreation. Marriage is not a bad thing. That's not what Paul's saying in this passage. He's not saying you should be celibate and, and all this other stuff. He's not saying that. But look at verse 34. There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin I thought that was kind of interesting because Paul's saying a single woman is supposed to be a virgin. A virgin or a wife. The unmarried woman, and you know, and we're going to get into the thing, what happens if you know you've fornicated all for years and years and years and then and then you get saved and whatever else. We'll talk about that. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Those of you out there that are single women, that are saying you really don't want to get a husband and things like that, um, have you been holy both in body and in spirit? Because I've heard of a lot of women that aren't. They have, you know, things that they're doing and whatever else, some sex perversion. They dabble in some sex perversion. Now, of course, you repent of it. And you say, I'm sorry for it and whatever else. But you don't want a man in your life. You want Jesus in your life, but not a man, a Christian man, who can be there physically and tell you what to do. And you have to be submissive to him. I don't want that. That's kind of strange. I mean, is Jesus real to you, or is he just some imaginary friend that you have? This is the Word of God. You're going to submit to it? But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. You say, well, then the first one's better than the second one, right? No, keep reading. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. He didn't say, this I speak, you know, that you can, you know, I got to warn you about the first. He's speaking it for their profit. It's not a condemnation. I mean, think about Aquila and Priscilla. They were a godly couple. They were able to do a lot for the Lord. Certainly. Um, if you're a single woman, wouldn't you like to have a Christian husband that can provide for you so that you don't have to work outside the home? How fervently do you pray for that? Something to think about. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 through 15. I mean, you know, you go back to the, to the Garden of Eden and the Lord says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helpmeet for him. God's original design for man is to have a wife, to be a helpmeet. You know, uh, I don't think too much of the, a lot of what the pearls put out, uh, Michael and Debbie Pearl, but, you know, she had a, she made a book, wrote a book called uh, Created to Be a Helpmeet. Encouraging women to pray for a godly husband. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as, I, as also I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. Hmm. And the head of Christ is God. 
but you're a single woman and you don't want a man over, over you. So it's a problem. Oh, you're a feminist. You're a strong woman. You're, you got a good career. You got a this, you got a that. You don't need a man to tell you what to do. Then you're denying scripture. Are you really a Bible-believing Christian? Verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or pro prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, if, I did a study on this years ago. The first part of chapter 11 here is all about... Uh, for, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 12, it's about a spir or, uh, yeah, spiritual covering. Verse um, 13 through 15 is about a physical covering. People try to make it physical. You gotta, if you're a woman, you've got to pray with this thing on your head. Uh, it doesn't tell you what to pray with your, on your head. It doesn't say a little uh, cap on the back or a, a full thing or a, a napkin. It's pinned up here. So it doesn't say anything about that. If you're supposed to have some kind of thing, cloth covering your head, before you pray as a woman, um, there'd be instructions there, okay? I mean, can a woman, you know, is it okay if she wears a cowboy hat, you know, while she's praying? No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about covering there. How do you know? Verse 3, the head of the woman is the man. You see? But look at it. Verse 5, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Hmm. So praying without a spiritual covering. You say, well, how does that work? Pray without a spiritual covering, then you're dishonoring your spiritual covering. Well, ultimately, your spiritual covering is Jesus Christ. But a man in your life, your husband, you're to reverence him as unto Christ. It's what you're supposed to do. And there are times, let me just say this, when the Lord will reveal things through a man to his wife. And she'll get to experience what it's like to live with what would be like a physical manifestation of Jesus Christ. Right there. We're going to see it. I'm going to show you the scriptures. You can get, oh, oh this is heretical. I've never heard of it. I'm going to show you the scriptures. She's to have reverence for her husband. She's to submit to her husband. But if you say, I don't want a husband. I don't want anything to do with men. I could never have a husband. I, I just, no, get him, out of, get, get him away from me. Well, you're going to have a real problem. Verse 6. For if the woman be not covered, spiritually, let her also be shorn, physically. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. I heard a thing that one time they said that, you know, back in the first century, a woman that had a shaved head was a prostitute. So it's basically just saying, you know, if you don't, if you're not willing to get married, you, know, you might as well just shave your head and look like a prostitute. I mean, what a, what a terrible thing to say to Christian women, right? It's the Bible. Verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this calls ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. It's another interesting thing there. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Now what did we read earlier? We read that some are already turned aside after Satan, the young women. Serpent beguiling Eve. We read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, they are to come together again, lest set, Satan tempt the knots for their incontinency. The devil is called an angel of light in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Hmm. But there are other angels. And they find it very uh, attractive, apparently, I guess, when they see a feminist woman. And she doesn't have a man there as a spiritual covering. How sin and death came into the world. Eve got away from Adam. She got away from her covering. And you'd say, well, then a, then a woman's never allowed to be any place where her husband isn't. I didn't say that. 
You can be away from your husband as a woman, as a Christian wife. But if some guy comes along and starts talking to you, you're going to say, excuse me, i got to go get my husband. See, it was no sin for Eve to walk away from Adam. There was no sin in that. What the sin was is when Satan started to talk to her and she started to have a little conversation with him. She doesn't need Adam around, you know, ruining the things. Oh, I'm a strong woman. I'll handle this. Yeah, look how that worked out. It's God's system. You can get upset. You can post nasty comments and whatever else. But at the end of the day, you got to answer to God. And you got to deal with His Word. And feminism is witchcraft. Again, I did a whole study on that. I mean, I, I actually read quotes from uh, leading, you know, some of the big feminist, you know, philosophizers and things or, or philosophers. Yeah, well, I'm getting mixed up. Uh, you know, uh, women that are into the feminist philosophy, I'll say it that way. Um, and the one was, you know, basically the result, the uh, goal of, of feminism is witchcraft. Goddess worship and things like that. You can... You know, listen to my study of the sin of feminism. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know, again, you know, women are going to be, oh, you know, it's so sexist and so this and so that. You're putting women down and things. You know, if I, if I took this beautiful crystal vase, you know, just beautiful, handmade, you know, hand-blown, whatever, you know, and I sit here, be very gentle with this. Please take care of this. Hold this. You know, nobody would say to me, oh, you're, you're, you're just being judgmental and things. God created women to be sensitive. God created women to be a help meet to a man. A man's supposed to be there as a man, a strong man. If something goes bump in the night, it's the man that gets out of the bed and goes and takes care of it. A man is supposed to be the one that protects his wife. If he's out in public and he sees some guy trying to flirt with his wife, the man goes over and says, hey, what are you doing? That's the way it's supposed to be. That's God's system. And if you depart from that, you're not right with God. And there's people that are saved. Understand, there are people that are saved that are not right with God. They get out of fellowship with the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them look it up themselves at home. No, it doesn't say that. It says, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Um, how do single women ask their husbands at home? And believe me, I understand, I understand there are single women out there and you just, you'd love to be married, you've prayed and everything else. Um, you don't have a husband yet, but you know, you really put your faith in the Lord, he'll provide. I believe that. And you know, I mean, when you, when you corner the Lord and you say, hey, Lord, you know what your word says, and you go over these scriptures, you, you remind the Lord of these scriptures that I'm sharing with you today. You bring these things up to the Lord and you say, hey, you know what, Lord? Your word says this stuff. I'm supposed to have a husband. I need a husband, Lord. You please provide one for me. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own selves. Because you're a good, strong feminist, right? No. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's what I was talking about earlier. A woman can see aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ in her husband. And you know what? A good woman will in help her husband to increase in that. If a man has a problem with pornography, a good woman is going to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be there in a loving, submissive way to say, Honey, please don't look at that stuff. Hey, honey, can I sit with you? I, I remember there was a brother, he had a problem with it, and he said, he told his wife, he said, you, you make the computer password protected and don't give me the password. And if I need to look up something online, I want you sitting right beside me. And she did it. 
She helped him with his problem. A woman, a good wife, will come along and say, Hey, you know what? I want to make you more like Jesus Christ. Husband. Let's continue. So what about if you're lost and your husband's lost and things like that? You're saved, your husband's lost. We're going to get to that. Verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You say, well, yeah, that's married women. What about single women? I will let the young women marry. I think one of the biggest, most frustrating things that I deal with in the ministry is people trying to find loopholes to get away from t doing what God told them to do. The scriptures are so crystal clear on some things and some issues, and yet, oh, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, and you search the scriptures trying to find a loophole to justify what you're doing. It's insane. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 through 15. And it's good. You know, I mean, again, the feminists will say, well, I think, I guess you suppose all women should be barefoot and pregnant. That's a big thing, you know, and people, oh, oh, well, oh, and that's supposed to make me feel bad as a, as a Christian preacher. You know, well, let's look at that for a minute. Women should be barefoot and pregnant. Okay, I've never said that, number one. Bible term is with child, not pregnant. But, you know, let's just, let's just look at that for a minute. Barefoot. Is it an unhappy thing to be barefoot? I mean, you know, you can really do the study on the whole thing. Most shoes for women uh, will deform your feet horribly. Uh, that's a whole other study, the thing of foot fashion, you know, foot deforming footwear. Uh, most shoes for women are terrible. I mean, if you want to look up something, you know, look up a chiropractor, what they say about high heels for women, they're terrible for you. Absolutely terrible. So what's wrong with being barefoot? You know, and the thing about pregnant, you're barefoot and pregnant, as the feminists say. Again, um, having children, what's wrong with that? A child that loves you and, and things, you know? It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. But see, Satan, working through witchcraft as feminism, has come out and, and you know, browbeats women and stuff into thinking, that it's somehow demeaning or whatever else to say, I'm a wife, I submit myself to my husband. It's not, it's not demeaning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere with lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women, let the woman, excuse me, learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What are you going to do with all that? Well, I want to be a strong single woman. I don't need a man in my life and whatever else. You're playing with fire. It's a very, very, very dangerous thing. And it's interesting, too, because most single women I've ever met, uh, they don't follow verse 9. They don't adorn themselves in modest apparel. They'll dress very immodestly. Number two, they do not, do not have shamefacedness. What's shamefacedness? It means bashful. Why? Hey, you're a strong woman. You've got to be out there doing things on your own. You ain't got no man around to tell you what to do, you know. 
Uh, so you got to be out there. You got to be calling the plumber. You got to be doing this, and you got to be fixing your flat tire, and you got to have your job, and you got to go open up an account. And how can you be bashful? Shamefacedness. Sobriety. What is sobriety? It means being calm and serious. Again, how can you be? How can a single woman fulfill verse 9? And it doesn't say wives there, by the way, I might add. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. It doesn't say anything about a wife. Women. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. No female preachers, in other words. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? You say, what's that have to do with a woman? How much of that stuff there in verses 1 through 5, how much of it does a wife have a hand in? Look at it. Bishop then must be blameless. How can a man be blameless if he's got a rotten wife? The husband of one wife. Is she going out and fornicating behind his back? Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Given to hospitality? I mean, we could get into each one of these in details, but let, you know, let's just keep this thing going here. Given to hospitality... How can he if his wife is not a good keeper at home? You see what I'm saying? Well, I'm a career woman. I don't have time to, to cook and clean and things like that and make things with my hands and, and whatever. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Will a man struggle with some of that stuff? Sure. But if he has a good, strong wife there that can guide the house and encourage him in his walk with the Lord, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. You know, maybe instead of, if you're a single Christian woman, maybe instead of looking and saying, what can I get out of marriage? How about maybe look and say, what can I give to a man in marriage? Is there some man out there, some single Christian man that needs a help meet? Is there some guy out there in ministry or some guy that's just a regular Christian working man or whatever else? Is there some man out there that I can come into his life and be a good helpmate for him and help him to be the man that God wants him to be? Let me tell you something. I wouldn't be in the ministry today if it wasn't for the Lord bringing my wife into my life. I was very, very, very miserable as a single man. Extremely miserable. And I was struggling with a lot of different things. And the Lord brought my wife along. She's fixed up my health tremendously. She encourages me in the ministry. I mean, I was, there was a time when we were down in Pennsylvania and I was just like, you know, I'm quitting. I'm done. I just, I can't do this anymore. And she, I remember she took me by the arms and she looked at me and she said, Honey, I believe in you. And I'm not going to let you quit. And that just it meant everything to me. I still talk to her about that, you know. We're actually just talking about it last night. And it, it, how many times she's been there to help me. How many times I've come along and I say, you know, i, I got to find this thing for the study and I just can't find it. And she goes, well, let me just check. I mean, th I remember the one thing, um, the uh, uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism studies, uh, there was a, a point where I talked about that the Catholic churches have the altar up front that says, you know, this do in remembrance of me, you know, on the thing draped over the front or carved into the front of the altar. And a lot of Baptist churches do the same thing. Same altar, this do in remembrance of me. Same thing, identical. And I've seen this stuff. I had, you know, I've, I had a, a Catholic, um, you know, church with that altar up front. And I was like, I you know, can't find a Baptist one and things. And I was you know, looking and looking and looking, trying to go through Google Images and, and trying to look up other things. And I just could not find it. 
And I said to her, I was like, I'm just like, I'm not going to include it in the study. I can't find it. And she said, just give me a minute. It wasn't even, I think it was like three minutes later. And she's like, oh, how's this? Found the perfect pictures. They're in the study. A lot of that work, a lot of the photos and a lot of the documentation was, was my wife's work. Um, she's a helpmate, you see. Verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Hmm. He must have a good report of them which are without. Keep your hand right there. And go on back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31. Who can find, Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. You know, through there, it's really amazing things that this woman does. But look at verse 23. We read back here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Proverbs 31, verse 23, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Hmm. So a woman has a big part in a man succeeding. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, if you're a Christian woman, um, why don't you seek to do that? Are you just going to do your single and sassy thing, you know? Uh, I'm a single strong woman. I got my own thing going and whatever else. I don't want a man in my life. Again, how's that work with Jesus Christ? I don't really get that. But I don't want to, I don't want to marry myself off to some man. I don't, I don't have a need there, a sexual need. Well, maybe it's just not sexual need. Maybe you need to consider that there might be a man out there that needs your emotional support. Maybe there's a man out there that needs you to be there for him to cook and clean and to take care of his things for you or for him. What about that? <coughs> Continue. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and let, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Can you be that for a man out there? Single woman? See, maybe instead of you saying, Hey, I want the you know, Lord, please provide a husband for me because I, I want I want to have this man that I can love and fall in love with and everything else and just all this stuff. Maybe you ought to say, you know what, Lord, I want to be placed into a ministry. I want to be placed in service for you, Lord, and as a help me to some great man of God out there. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Hmm. Um, some are already turned aside after Satan. You say, oh, you're stretching it. Come on, oh, come on. Let's keep reading. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. I know a lot of uh, single Christian women that speak lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils. You say, well, I don't forbid other people to marry. What about you? Do you forbid yourself to marry? Do you say, I don't want a man in my life. I'm good on my own. Better think about that. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> this, is, 
This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Here's where it gets interesting. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I know there are Christian women out there, single Christian women, that are ever learning and yet never able to come to just a simple truth of saying, you know what, I shouldn't be living this way and whatever else. I should have a husband to provide for me. And uh, it's worse than that. I know of single Christian, professing Christian, I'll say it that way, women that are living in situations that men have crept in. Creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Some are already turned aside after Satan. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. I know of situations that women that say that they're saved, they're in situations where men are in their lives and they're fornicating. They're in sin. But you see, they sear their conscience with a hot iron and they say, speaking lies and hypocrisy, you know, well, no, I don't, I don't really want a man in my life. Then what are you doing fornicating? As I said, one of my studies, I remember going to a, a Baptist church the one time, and it was like, they're living together, they're living together, they're living together, not married. Whoremongers. That's what the Bible calls them. Men and women living together outside of marriage. It's not supposed to be that way. It's wickedness. But, you know, I'm a strong woman. I don't need a man in my life. I'll just have a guy that I can come into my home and just stay with me and live with me. And, and you know, occasionally there's some things that happens and stuff like that and whatever. But, you know, I, I, it just, I, I confess it. I get it under the blood and I get back in fellowship with the Lord. You're not in fellowship with the Lord. You're not in fellowship with the Lord. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can study this book and listen to preaching and all kinds of stuff. But if there is sin in your life and the Lord says... Get that sin out of your life and you say, nothing doing, I'm not going to have, you know, have anything to do with that. You've not come to the knowledge of the truth. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their single life. Oh, well, no, it doesn't say that. It says to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You say, that's so sexist. I don't like your tone. I don't like your attitude. Then you might, might want to get saved, okay? You might want to repent of being a wicked feminist. I mean, why would you find these words repulsive if you're a woman and you profess to be saved? Is this the word of God or isn't it? Are you going to submit yourself to the Bible? Or are you going to be just ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? You can watch my sermons, you know, you can, I mean, you know, that's one of the big disadvantages of, of not, you know, being face to face all the time and things like that. I don't, I can't know what your situation is and I get lied to so much, you know, and, and I say, oh, you got to, you know, confess all your sins to Brian Denling or Pope Denling or something like this. No, stupid. People come to me and they ask for advice, but then they don't tell me the truth. All right? That's what I was saying. I'm not saying that people need to confess their sins to me. What good would that do? 
What I'm saying is, if you come to me and say, I'd like some advice on this, and don't tell me all the, the details of what advice you're asking for, don't come to me for advice. You understand? You get somebody who comes and they say, Brother Brian, I've really messed up. I did this and that and that, you know, whatever. And I say, yeah, you really did mess up here. I'll give you my advice. Okay, fine. But you're going to have to deal with God someday. And God's going to be a lot tougher and a lot stricter than I am going to be. God knows what you're doing. You can lie to me. You can deceive me. And Lord knows it's happened plenty of times. I've had people lie to me and deceive me. But you know what? You're going to be dealing with God someday. In judgment, you're dealing with Him right now, by the way, in your life. And if you lie to the Lord, and if you're a hypocrite before the Lord, God will wreck your life. I will guarantee you that. Let's continue. 1 Peter chapter 3. See, what about a, a saved woman that's married to a lost man? Let's look about that. I am fully aware that there are women out there that get married, get married as lost women and they get saved and things and then they got a husband that doesn't want to do with the Lord and whatever. What's your advice? Or the advice for you, I'll say it that way. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also with or they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Hmm. And conversation there doesn't just mean your speech, that's important, but also your demeanor, your actions, your behavior. Verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, if, you know, if I was a woman and I read that, I would say, hmm, meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? If you're a woman, you need to look at that verse there and you need to take that thing seriously. Do you want to be in the sight of God of great price? worth a lot to the Lord? Then you submit to the Scriptures. Verse 5, For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker Bessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Women are weaker vessels. I get so irritated, you know, I hear this stuff, you know, science has proved that, that, that uh, women can handle pain better than men. I think that is stupid. How does science prove that? How do you prove that? You take man A and woman B over here, and you put them together, and you, and you inflict pain on them, apparently, well, you can pick a sissy man and a tougher woman. How do you prove that? I mean, does that does that true over just across the board? Every every different ethnicity out there, the the women are always able to take more pain than the men. They say, what about childbirth? Okay. Um, what about accidents that men get into? Work related accidents. What about war? When men are you know losing arms and losing legs and and surviving, you know the thing, um, you know. <laughs> You know, it's it's to me it's 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 fake science. It's an opposition of science, falsely so called. I mean, again, you can take a university and you can pick the people for your study and just kind of eliminate certain results if they don't go along with what your preconceived notion is that women are just as strong, in fact, stronger than men, and stuff like this. It's nonsense. The Bible says a woman is a weaker vessel. Plain and simple. And so a woman should say, hey, you know what, my husband there, if he's a man, if he acts like a man, yeah, he doesn't know Jesus Christ, but thank you, husband, for providing for me. I appreciate that. And I'm not saying a woman that's, that's you know, saved and married to a lost man, she shouldn't submit in terms of if he says, hey, let's go out to the bar tonight, let's get drunk. 
honey, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. You know, the Bible says I'm not supposed to, you know, drunkenness and things like that are abomination to the Lord. I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, and I'll tell you what, if you're a woman, you can gain some power over a man by acting like a lady, acting and looking like a lady. I mean, I've, I think I might have told this story before, but I remember we were at this uh, um, grocery store the one time. My wife is walking out and she's got her long, modest dress on and she goes to get in her, you know, she opens up her side of the vehicle and an older man is walking with his manly looking woman. Yeah, I know I told this before, but just to prove my point. Um, and he's walking, his wife looks just like he does, you know, short hair, jeans, the whole deal, pants, you know, in other words. And um, they're walking and the man leaves his wife's side, comes over and gets the door for my wife and, and, and she picks up her dress and, he, and she says, thank you. And he goes, oh, not at all. You know, and he shuts the door and he goes over and doesn't get the door for his wife. You know, a man probably in the late 60s or something like that. He saw a lady. You see, if you're a lost woman, uh, or excuse me, if you're a saved woman married to a lost man, excuse me, uh, do you dress like a lost woman? Or do you dress and act like a lady, a Christian lady? You see, the secret here for how you live your life as a Christian is you say, well, I'm in a rough situation. Okay, go through the Bible and do what the Lord tells you to do, you to do. I have to go through the Bible and I have to say, okay, I'm a preacher. I'm a man. I'm not supposed to act effeminate. I'm supposed to speak the truth in love, and I do. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be wishy-washy and a little milk toast. It just means I love you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat things and deceive you, Okay. So I look through the Bible and I see what I'm supposed to do, my marching orders, so to speak, from God. And I'm going to do those things. And if I have a rough situation, I'm just going to do what the Lord tells me to do and, and believe that He's going to get me out of it. Now, if you're a woman that's saved and you're married to a lost man, do what the Bible tells you to do. And if your marriage blows up and whatever else, well, God's going to provide something better. You never know what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, you start to give some respect to your husband and you start to thank him for working hard and for being there to protect you and things like that. You never know. But if you're a single woman, I'm telling you, it's just, it's a dangerous thing. Second Peter chapter 2. You know, and I should say, by the way, too, that uh, if a woman is single um, and she's not married, I think that she needs to live with her father. You know, again, I've seen that, you know, women get away and they, you know, from their father's protection, from their father's spiritual covering. And uh, they get out there and they, they uh, get messed up, go into the career world and whatever else. And guys start taking advantage of them and things. And, um, you know... <laughs> It's a bad situation. Again, God has his standards. And you can't say, well, this happened to me, so therefore God has to change his standards to match my life. No, it doesn't work that way. You say, well, what happens if a woman doesn't have a father, if he's dead or, or he's just totally God-hating and whatever else? Uh, well, uh, that's something that you need to pray about very hard, you know, about that whole thing. Um, again, I would say that at that point in time, you know, maybe there's a Christian family that could take a single woman in or something like that. That's kind of dangerous. I mean, again, I think the best thing to do is just simply pray very, very, very fervently and say, Lord, you know, I need a husband. And again, you know, a lot of women I know have written to me and oh, whatever, you know, help, help me with this or that. Okay, fine. But, you know, the big thing is you got to get a husband of your own. You know, get a godly husband. And if he's a man that's, that's saved or whatever, do your part to, to help him become more godly. You're a helpmeet, remember? You're created to be a helpmeet. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. I think this is true of a lot of the uh, women I've had, you know, not all of them. I'm not condemning all of you, but I'm saying there's women I've had contact with, and this is very true of them. 
2 <clears throat> Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, like we read earlier, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Mm -hmm. Again, I've seen this thing, uh, women that had really perverse pasts or whatever else, and they come and they hear about salvation and they make a profession of faith and whatever, and, and they just, they're there, they're ever learning, but they don't come to the knowledge of the truth of saying, hey, you know what, I need to get, I need to get a husband. I want to be married to a godly man. And they start praying for that. No, they don't want that. And a lot of times the lust builds up and it's building, but they're just trying to keep it covered and, and just kind of, I'm just going to keep ever, you know, ever learning. I'm going to keep with my studies and things like that. They escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I guess what happens? They are again entangled therein and overcome. They got the head knowledge. I'm studying the Bible. I'm studying the Bible. And all of a sudden, wham, they fall. They mess around with sexual sin. And what happens? The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. The sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Goes right back to it. All because you wouldn't follow God's system. You see? I will that the young women marry. Bear children. Guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. No, thank you. I don't want that. I'm going to do my thing. You're not going to make it. Revelation chapter 2. We'll end here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou, hast, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Yeah. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. If you think that you can mess around with sexual sin and mess around with the thing of feminism and whatever else and say, I don't want a husband, I don't need a man in my life, um, your end is coming. It's not going to be good. Uh, if you're a single Christian woman, my suggestion is fervent prayer that God would bring a man into your life that you can be a helpmate to. Uh, not I, I have you know sexual desire and things that's there too. If you if you're burning with lust and things, well then you should marry, sure. But if you're just like oh I don't really have that real strong desire, um, well then maybe pray about having a man be in your life that you can be a helpmate to him. Help him in the ministry. Help him with his walk with the Lord. But uh, especially in this day and age, being a single Christian woman is an extremely dangerous thing. Very, very dangerous. And uh, if you can move back in with your parents, back in with your father, and live under his roof, do that. If you are a married woman that's been divorced and whatever else, try to get back with your husband, the one that you divorced. Okay? Uh, you need to do that. If you are a single woman um, that doesn't have a father or something like that, well, you better pray very fervently for the Lord to provide a husband. Um, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, I, I just have seen this thing for a long time now. I've known of many different situations with this where women just refuse to submit themselves to the Word of God and just say, nope, sorry, don't need it. Um, it's a bad idea to do that. So that is going to be it. 
Uh, I will continue to preach the Word of God without compromise as God gives me strength. And um, if I get kicked off of the Internet, I think it's going to be the body of Christ that does it eventually. Or I should say, not the body of Christ, I should say the uh, professing Christians um, that are probably going to want me kicked off. They're the ones that are doing more exposés of Brian Denlinger than pretty much anybody else. <laughs> um, the time is, going to, is coming and is already here when they will not endure sound doctrine. So, but I'm going to continue. As God is my witness, by the grace of God, I will continue to preach the truth. And uh, without compromise, I've compromised too many times, I should say, in the past. I don't want to compromise anymore because uh, that's not true love. So, I love you, and I hope that you will submit yourself to the Word of God, King James Bible. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.